Lee, the Collections Manager here at the Kelch Aviation Museum. And I'm here today to give you a little tour and a little history lesson about U.S. airmail, featuring this U.S. mail biplane from 1928. Nowadays, when we talk about mail, we often call it snail mail because it's kind of slow. It used to be a lot slower back when we transported mail on horseback or in a train. But in 1918, the United States Postal Service launched their air mail service, and they started transporting mail in airplanes, biplanes like this. Yes, open cockpit, yes, all weathers. It transformed the way we think about mail because suddenly you could get a letter across the country in less than 48 hours. Before that, on a train, it took a whole week or more. Um, I know that doesn't sound very exciting now, but think of it like the FedEx, the overnight FedEx of the 1920s. It was unheard of so fast. You could send something to your grandma and have it there in time for her birthday even if you'd forgotten. That had never been possible before in the history of mankind. So it was a huge deal. Originally, airmail was only flown during the day, but in 1924, the Postal Service started delivering mail by day and by night. How did they do this? Because they were flying in biplanes like this. There was no radio communication with the ground, no radar, no GPS system. They just had to look where they were going. I think that is so cool. So look at this illustration. There is a airmail beacon here with stylized beams of light. They're black, but let's just pretend that they're bright. In 1924, they set up 616 airmail beacons with flashing lights from San Francisco, California to New York City, New York. And the pilots would take off and look out into the distance and every 10, 20, 30 miles, there would be another airmail beacon. If the weather was great, you could see maybe five out in front of you. If the weather wasn't, you might not even see one. We have an airmail beacon right here at the Broadhead Airport where the Kelch Aviation Museum is located because Broadhead, Wisconsin is right in the middle of the route between St. Paul, Minnesota and Chicago. I would take you outside right now to show you, but it is snowing and it is zero degrees and I don't want to go outside and get cold. But if I was an airmail pilot, I'd still have to fly. They flew in all weathers, all seasons, and yes, the cockpit was open. Imagine being an airmail pilot in the 20s. What was it like? I don't know, I'm not an airmail pilot, but I've done a lot of research. It sounds like an amazing job, but also really scary. Amazing because you got to fly these planes and see the countryside at a time when it was hard to travel. And you also made a lot of money. The average household income in the 1920s was $1,300 in the USA, and an aerial pilot would make closer to $4,000. This proves that commercial pilots have been making way more money than anyone else since the beginning of commercial piloting. Well, there's a reason. It was very risky. In 1918, the US Postal Service originally hired 40 pilots. Two years later, in 1920, half of them had died in crashes. It did get slightly less dangerous by the late 20s. They were having no fatalities at all, just, just letting you know. A lot of those crashes were induced by the weather, which is another thing about being an airmail pilot that sounds really terrible. You had to fly, come rain or come shine. So a lot of pilots ended up just having to bail out and parachute to the ground because they could not see. So I really wanted to show you guys what an airmail pilot's outfit would look like with his parachute and warm clothes for the winter. We don't have an airmail pilot suit here at the museum, but in the archives we do have this World War II flying outfit with a parachute and these flying pants. They're really cool. I'm small, so they aren't fitting me quite right, but um, they zip up the leg and they've got fur and canvas and these big zipper pockets to your inside pocket. So if you need like your watch or a bologna sandwich, you can get it there. And then this parachute, which is very heavy and uncomfortable. I mean, it feels like I'm gonna fall even faster than I would otherwise, but they tell me that's not how that works. There would be a jacket, but we don't have it in the collection. Um, but we do have these giant gloves made of leather and fur, they're very warm. I'm not sure how you would like deal with any delicate controls with these, but um, they would certainly keep you warm. This was donated to us by a wonderful man named Bill Amundsen. He was a World War II vet. He was a great friend of the museum and at the airport. He has sadly passed away, but we are so glad and so honored that he donated these items to us so that we could preserve them and show them and help people learn from them for generations to come. Okay, back to the airplane. Back in the 20s and the teens, there was no weather forecast. There was no weather forecast, no radio forecast, like maybe sometimes in the newspaper, but it wasn't accurate. I mean, imagine that. 
nowadays it would be fun to go for a ride in this airplane and you know it's exciting and it's very vintage but even as you're flying in an original style airplane you still have your phone in your back pocket and you know what the weather is before you leave your house so you know if it's safe to fly in the 20s no weather forecast at all. If you were a pilot, you were just on your own. Here you were in this little cockpit. In the cockpit up front, you would have several just bags of mail, literally bags of mail. Most pilots flew 200 to 500 feet off the ground so that they could navigate by sight. So how does a person recognize an airplane or track down an airplane, especially after like 80 years? The registration number. This airplane is NC6496. That's important to the story. And it has had this number since it was built in 1928. So this was a mail plane for six years, first throughout Ohio, and then later in and out of Chicago. After that, Delta Airlines bought it. Yes, the same Delta that you could buy an airplane ticket on for tomorrow, they were in existence back then, and they were running crop dusters in Texas. So they bought this airplane, took it to Texas, and turned it into a crop duster for many years. Much later, our board member at the museum, Mike Williams, he was doing some research and found a picture of this airplane back in 1930. And it just so happens that Mike Williams is a pilot with Delta. And he found out that this plane had been involved really early on in Delta's existence. He thought, how cool would it be to find that plane now? Well, he found its registration number and discovered that it was still in existence, and he bought it. In fact, it was still flying, so he did fly it a couple times, but discovered it needed work, and he decided to restore it completely to how it would have been when it was built in the 20s. So he and fellow board member Kent McMakin, they restored it to its beautiful condition today. It does fly, Mike flies it here. We love having it on loan at the museum. That's all for now, folks. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed learning about air mail and about this airplane, and I really hope you will come visit us in the summer of 2021 when we have finally opened our doors. In the meantime, keep supporting us, watch our videos, let us know what other videos you'd like to see. Consider donating. The museum is a nonprofit, and your donation is not just tax deductible, but very appreciated. Thank you. Bye. P.S. If you want, Go to our website and sign up for our newsletter. We publish a really cool quarterly newsletter with information about the museum and also stories like this and features on airplanes like this. And it will probably be delivered to you on some form of airmail. Not a biplane, but you get the picture.